Good afternoon. My name is Matthew Sackle. I, I am the Associate Manager of Education at the Illinois Holocaust Museum and Education Center. On behalf of our CEO, Susan Abrams, Board of Directors, staff, and volunteers, I am honored to welcome each of you to today's program. The mission of the Illinois Holocaust Museum and Education Center is expressed in our founding principle, remember the past, transform the future. The museum is dedicated to preserving the legacy of the Holocaust by honoring the memories of those who were lost and by teaching universal lessons that combat hatred, prejudice, and indifference. Today, our program, Pearl Harbor, the surprise military strike that led the US to war is our last program in our Liberation 2020 series. We would like to thank our series partner, media sponsor and community partners who were listed on the screen prior to the start of the program. The day that will live on in infamy was the seminal phrase Franklin D. Roosevelt used in his historic address to describe the empire of Japan's attack on the US naval base at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii in December of 1941. Immediately following his speech, the US Congress voted to declare war on Japan. In advance of Pearl Harbor Remembrance Day, today you will hear unique insights about historic details surrounding these infamous events from historian Daniel Martinez. Daniel Martinez is the chief historian for the Pearl Harbor National Museum including the USS Arizona Memorial and Visitor Center, the USS Utah Memorial, the USS Oklahoma Memorial, the Chief Petty Officer Bungalows on Ford Island, and the mooring quays that were part of Pearl Harbor's Battleship Row. We have hundreds of people attending the program today and from around the nation and even the globe. We will have a short time for an audience Q&A at the end of our program. We will do our best to get to as many questions as possible. Welcome, David. Thank you. And Daniel, you're on. Okay. Well, uh, everybody out there, aloha from Hawaii. Uh, my name uh, has been introduced, uh, Daniel Martinez, and uh, I had the pleasure of becoming part of the National Park Service career at Little Bighorn uh, when I was undergrad, and I fell in love with the Park Service, and that brought me to Hawaii in 19, summer of 1985. And I have been the historian beginning in 1989. And um, there's nothing that I value so much as uh, having a career in the Park Service. And uh, I guess uh, one of the things is, is uh, I've over the years been able to speak, speak and meet such uh, uh, notable people. And, I, and when I say notable, it's the Pearl Harbor survivors and also Japanese aviators and, and sailors that were part of this tragic day of 7 December 1941. It's interesting um, to note that um, for, uh, I did a little research on when the first um, Jewish person came to Hawaii and that was in 1798. He was a cook and he was aboard a ship called the Neptune. And uh, so he uh, had the opportunity to meet at the time the Hawaiian king and uh, merchants began arriving, Jewish merchants began arriving in Hawaii in 1850 to 1900. Um, in 1901, there was the first congregation of, 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 uh, of those of the Jewish faith of the, uh, created the Hebrew uh, congregation here in the, on the island of Oahu. So um, uh, doing this for the Holocaust Museum and, and connecting with the um, history of Jewish uh, people here in Hawaii, um, you can see how early that was. And so um, we can move on to our talk. Uh, I'd want to uh, try to share with you the events that took place uh, in December of 1941 and also share with you that um, uh, my, uh, my family was here during the attack and um, 
and, and experienced uh, what had happened. My grandfather was at Pearl Harbor when it was attacked. And my mother who was 10 years old and her sister who was in high school and my grandmother were in Honolulu. And in fact, at church at mass that morning when the attack took place. So I have part of my history of my family. We were here. So I think we'll be starting with our first slide. Okay. Give me two seconds here. Sure. go. It's loading. Here we go. Okay. All right. And we'll go to slide number one. This story is so, uh, I guess, vast in its history to try to summarize it as we're doing today, I'll leave a lot, a lot of things out, but I will make some recommendations for books for further reading. What you're looking at is a picture that was taken in October of 1941, uh, taken by the Navy. And this is the Pearl Harbor Naval Base. If you look carefully towards the top of the screen, you can see the entrance to the harbor, and then you can see an island in the middle of it. And what appears to be a flat surface is the runway. And that is the um, Pearl Harbor Naval Air Station. If you look around that island, you'll see ships along the um, left side of it, and that is the famed Battleship Row. The waters of Pearl Harbor, or as the Hawaiians called it, the waters of Pualoa, you can see how interesting this harbor is. It spreads out like a hand, and those, uh, those bodies of water that go off screen a little to the right uh, are part of the locks, L-O-C-H, locks. And uh, that was, they were named locks by a person that did uh, the, uh, the mapping. And he was from, uh, uh, from Scotland. And as a result, he, he named them locks. So uh, if, as we look at Pearl Harbor here, you can see uh, the harbor itself and a number of ships. Look up towards the top left and you'll see an airfield there, that's Hickam Field. And Hickam Field was, was one of the major airfields here. Uh, today, Hickam Field is uh, still there and the, the runway now runs to your left uh, of that and that's where you land when you come to Hawaii. Um, the Pearl Harbor Visitor Center is located right along where you see that body of, of water. It's very difficult, but the arrow would be over to the left, and that's where the Halava Stream comes in, and that's where the Pearl Harbor Visitor Center is, which I'll show you later. But you can see this is, this is where the Pacific Fleet moored. This would be the view of the Japanese aviators as they dealt, would dive down on the ships. And so this cockpit of war would see such death and destruction. But I want to make sure, and I'll show you in our next slide that we have, that um, the, when the Japanese Navy hit this island, they hit this island every major air base. Now let's go back just a little because the Japanese Navy left Northern Japan on the 26th of December, uh, November, excuse me. And they moved over those seas rapidly. They came in from the Northern part of the Pacific Ocean. Normally people would not be even find themselves there because in winter it is so rough but they had carefully scouted it. They had used one of their uh, uh, maroos, which is a kind of a combination freighter and liner to go over the path that they were going to uh, take to Pearl Harbor to see if any ships were there. And they found that it was a vacant sea. And so that was the route. The Japanese Navy would move from the 26th of November and be poised uh, uh, by December 7th, that morning at about 6 a.m they would be now 230 miles north of Oahu. So where you see the island and you see the, the uh, symbol first attack, 
that is north and the Japanese Navy was 230 miles away. It would take two hours of flight time for them to uh, reach the island. And when they did, they would then disperse out. The, uh, when the Japanese Navy came, they brought six aircraft carriers. No, never in history had this been done. The use of six aircraft carriers and over 230 aircraft uh, were going to be employed in this attack. Among the uh, types of planes would be fighters to suppress the airfields and any resistance in the air, horizontal bombers to bomb the airfields and the battleships at Pearl Harbor, dive bombers to take out targets of opportunity at all of the military bases, and the torpedo bombers, which you see in yellow, were meant to attack the battleships moored along battleship row, and also any ships moored on the opposite side of Ford Island. So what you see in, in this is the first and second wave attacks. The Japanese left nothing to, to chance. So they launched their first wave at approximately 6 a.m. An hour later, they launched the second wave. So the, the attack would commence on this island at just before eight o'clock. And so they came in from the north and they went along the North Shore where the famed surfing area is. And then they turned over the mountains. There's a mountain range that runs along the coastline down towards Eva. And you see EWA in Hawaiian, we pronounce the W's V. So that's Eva. When, when, when we know we have visitors here, they said they came from Iwa. And then we say, nope, that's Eva. So there was an airfield there. There was an airfield up at Wheeler Field another air station at Kaneohe Bay, that's a naval air station, and then Hickam Field. The Japanese plan was quite direct. They were gonna take out any of our aircraft so that they, there would be no resistance. So they immediately pounced on the airfields. Don't think of the attack of Pearl Harbor as Pearl Harbor. Think of it as the attack on Oahu. And this island came under attack almost simultaneously. The Japanese planes, for instance, if you're from the North Shore, where you see first attack, to fly to Pearl Harbor is less than four minutes. So they had the island under complete uh, control. That's why very few of our planes got up, less than, less than 11 to 12 aircraft actually even got up in the air. They immediately suppressed our, our planes that would have posed opposition to them by attacking the airfield fields at Wheeler at Kaneohe, at Hickam, at Eva, and the Pearl Harbor Naval Air Station. So within 15 minutes, air power in Hawaii ceased to exist. That's how horrific the attack was. It was, it was extremely fast and swift. And after these attacks are taking place, the planes that you see that were rounding and coming down the coastline, that red lines in the first attack, they will now circle around and begin their attack on Pearl Harbor. It's interesting to note, one of the Pearl Harbor survivors remembered, and he said, I was over, he was from the USS Utah, and he said he looked over towards the mountains, and he wondered what all that smoke was coming up in from the direction of where Wheeler Field was. He was unaware that the attack was already underway. Next slide. These are the Japanese planes uh, on the aircraft carrier Akagi, which was the main flagship. These are pictures of, this picture rather, is of the second wave because the first wave at 6 a.m. when it was launched, it was dark. They took off in darkness and imagine what that was like and then got in the air. So as these first uh, group of planes, uh, the first wave, which was about 183 aircraft, the second wave is here. These are all fighter planes. In the background are dive bombers and fighters. And you can see the crews getting ready to launch these planes. You can actually see the morning sun glinting off the edge of the wings and on the spinners of the aircraft. Next wave. This is an artist's rendition of the attack on Battleship Row. There were... Um, uh, seven battleships moored along uh, Battleship Road. They were majestic. They were near, each battleship was nearly uh, two, uh, you know, uh, uh, 
two football fields long. So, it, it, you know, when you look at this, you can see that this is the main battle line of the Pacific Fleet. And these battleships were intended to engage other battleships at sea. The Japanese plan was to immobilize the Pacific Fleet. They had hoped uh, that there would be carriers here, but fortunately for us, the carriers had been dispatched to deliver planes respectively to Wake Island and to Midway to reinforce the Marine detachments that were there to defend those islands. It is only a, a, a just a, a luck that they weren't there and the Japanese were deeply disappointed that the carriers were not there. Um, there's always been these kind of conspiracy theories, which I have no, uh, you know, I don't give any of them very much credence, but the, the fact that they were not there allowed us to fight the, the battles that were gonna be coming at the Coral Sea in May and the Battle of Midway in June of 1942. But right here, looking at this perspective, this torpedo, by the way, is well over 1,700 pounds. It has a special wooden fin. You see that, that back part and it looks like wood? Well, it is. It actually was painted silver, but for, for, for our discussion today, these wooden fins were meant to uh, overcome the difficulty the Japanese had. They had two difficulties, and, and I would like to explain those to you. First of all, the, to, the Pearl Harbor is only uh, you know 45 feet deep. That's shallow water. These torpedoes normally would have to would would take at least a hundred uh, to hundred. Uh, excuse me, over over 30 to 40 feet was not gonna be enough. They needed about 150 feet. So how do you get past this? Well, the Japanese technicians worked on this feverishly and found that if the torpedo plane slowed its, its speed, brought its the altitude down to 30 feet, and then attached these wooden fins, the torpedo would drop from the aircraft, slap the water, and then break apart as it, the, the, that is the fin would break apart and break the fall. And then the torpedo could run towards a target. The, the explosive power of these torpedoes could blow a hole that an average pickup truck could drive through. And so the torpedoes were very lethal weapons. So I hope you don't hear the neighbor dog right now barking, but you probably do. Let me just see if I can close that. So uh, we can go to the next slide. This is a dramatic photo taken of a, from a Japanese plane of the attack on Battleship Row. People have asked, well, why were they taking pictures? They took pictures and had planes assigned uh, in the attack group, uh, which was you know, massive. And so th what they did is they took pictures of what was going on so they could evaluate it later. And this dramatic picture shows First of all, Ford Island in the center. Over to your, right, uh, to your uh, left, you can see uh, three ships. And over there is the, respectively from right to left is the Raleigh, the Utah, and the um, Tangier. The, the Utah in the center has just been hit by a torpedo. And you can kind of see the oil slick coming out slightly if you, if you have, see it on your screen. And then if you look up here towards Battleship Row, you can see a Japanese torpedo plane rising up after it dropped its torpedo and this water geyser going nearly 200 feet in the air, if not more. And so this is the opening sequences of the attack on Pearl Harbor. Off to your right, you can see uh, the PBY ramp. And if, you, if the picture is full enough, you'll see the smoke coming up from that. This is one of the most dramatic pictures of World War II. Next slide. This was taken by a Japanese aviator as he flew over Battleship Row. And at the, the first ship you can see is the tops of the USS Nevada. We're gonna go right now from left to right. And then you'll see the USS Arizona with the the repair ship Vestal tied up next to it. You can then see a, a very dramatic picture of, of the USS Maryland. And you can see a torpedo has just slammed into the side. The oil's gushing out and look very carefully towards the main tops. 
the tops of the ship, and you can see the water guys are starting to raise up from the strike. You can see the trail of the torpedoes off to your left and the running towards the target. You can see at the top, Hickam Field. Remember I told you the airfields were being struck? Well, that's the smoke coming up from the damage to the planes and aircraft at Hickam Field. And as you go further down, you can see the famed Battleship Row. The National Park Service is now engaged in preserving the concrete mooring quays that you can see like little white objects. Those were what the ships tied up to. And we are now in the process of evaluating and preserving Battleship Row so that you can come as a visitor and see these preserved as they were on 7 December 1941. Off to the extreme right, you can see the bottom of, of um, Ford Island, and you'll see a, what looks like a little black kind of uh, line. It looks like snaking along the side, and that's the dredge pipe that is, it appears in a lot of pictures. People ask us, what's that? Is that about fuel? No, they were dredging the harbor, and they were pumping that dredge materials through there. So this is, again, another dramatic picture, seeing the harbor entrance. But more importantly, and I almost left it out, you are seeing the Pearl Harbor Naval Shipyard. And you can see ships in there. Those were attacked that morning, some of them as well. But you, you can see the harbor. You can see fuel tanks along there that are all part of it. And all of that is still here, most of it today. And in fact, a great number of the buildings that were witness buildings during the attack are still here. Next slide. This is an actual color picture that was taken. There were very few pictures taken. This was um, after the attack was over. This is the, the uh, battleship West Virginia. And you can see a, a man being pulled out of the water at the bow of that uh, a gig that's in the water. And I actually met one of the men that was in, on that gig and he signed a picture for me of him being on that. Uh, you can also see if you look up, uh, up uh, you can see men up on the mainmast here uh, on the West Virginia. The captain of the West Virginia would receive the Medal of Honor. Um, bombs were falling and there you can see a mast of another ship. That's the battleship Tennessee and a bomb hit uh, on, on that ship and it threw splinters uh, towards the uh, West Virginia where the bridge was and one of those splinters hit uh, Ca Captain Mervyn Benyon in, in the abdomen and uh, he, was, he was mortally wounded. And uh, the famed uh, African-American hero, Doris Miller and other men were sent up there to pick him up and take him down because the fires were starting to expand up there. And for that, Doris Miller was the first African-American to receive the Navy Cross. And you think of all the years that African-American sailors served our Navy from the Revolution to World War II, and he would be the first to receive that. Not the last, but the first. Next slide. This is the damage uh, done at Hickam Field. This, this aircraft you see here is a B-17 bomber. It was one of... Uh, of a group of B-17s that were flying in from Hamilton Field, which is located north of San Francisco, to come to Hawaii. They were eventually gonna fly from Hawaii to the Philippines. This particular plane was landing and it was shot up by a Japanese fighter. Of, of their, the reason you see it in half is it hit a flare, a flare package of, of flares, which would be normal for distress, right? And it caught fire, and that fire uh, broke that plane apart as it uh, landed down the runway. Um, and there's a real interesting, you'll see um, uh, this little um, tropical helmet and a box there. Uh, this was the signature of, of one of Tai Sing Lu, who was the official photographer for the United States Navy. He went over after the attack and took pictures. He was a Chinese American and, uh, and he was so upset because he was at Pearl Harbor when it was attacked, but he didn't have his camera. And imagine the pictures he could have taken as the official camera uh, a man for the Navy. But he did take a number of pictures of the destruction after the attack. Next slide. 
this is a pretty famous picture. It's not as clear as we'd like it, but it is taken of the flag over Hickam Field. The, uh, the largest barracks built in Hawaii is right behind you and it's burning. And the Japanese attacked the barracks so that the, the airmen there, which were US Army airmen, could not get to their stations. So it was heavily damaged. You can see that the flag itself has been torn by the machine gun bullets that were flying through the air. And today, if you have the opportunity and get access to Hickam Field, that building still stands and it's potmarked with bullet holes still. And the reason they didn't repair it is the commanding office of the time said, this is part of history and it should be a reminder for not being uh, alert or prepared. This is what happens. And you can see the bullet holes, uh, 1.1 and uh, 20 millimeter cannon holes that are uh, potmarked all along the side of that building, even today. Next slide. This was taken by a civilian uh, family uh, looking down at Pearl Harbor after the attack. The smoke you see barreling up in the distance is the USS Arizona burning in the late afternoon of December 7th. Um, off to your right, you'll see a smokestack in a building. That's the uh, what CNH Sugar uh, Refinery. At the time, it was the Hawaiian Sugar Company, but all of the people know what CNH Sugar is. You can also see a ship off to, the, um, off to the left of the roof of the building in the center, and that's the USS Vestal that was next to the Arizona. It had been hit by uh, uh, bombs, and it, one of the bombs actually went out the bottom of the ship and exploded. And so they came over to this shallow water and went aground to prevent themselves from sinking. So this is what the civilians that lived around Pearl Harbor could see because um, up around Pearl Harbor from this side, it rises to the mountains that are behind this building. And uh, you can see that, that these are, are manicured gardens and all of that. But this, the primary thing that was around Pearl Harbor, what you see all this real estate today was sugarcane fields. That was sugarcane fields and in the flatter fields near Eva, uh, pineapple. But this is a dramatic photo taken. And this is a series of pictures, by the way, taken by this family. Next slide. Um, this, this is often misinterpreted as a, um, the civilians you see here uh, being machine gunned uh, by Japanese planes. That's not what happened here. Unfortunately, this is the McCabe and Adams family. There were four in the car at that time. They had got the alert to return to Pearl Harbor because they were civilian workers like my grandfather, US government workers. My grandfather was a Navy government worker and they were headed to Pearl Harbor to assist and uh, the Navy and Army were firing rounds. We're not sure how this happened, but what happened was uh, a, um, the shells that were being fired were not fused. They're supposed to explode at a certain distance in the air and not fusing them meant that they came down all over Honolulu, even into Waikiki. Uh, when I first came here, a number of the residents talked about being bombed and they thought they were being bombed by the Japanese, but they weren't. They were being hit by friendly fire, which is a term that always kind of ex uh, escapes me. There was nothing friendly about this. It killed four of the family. And so when we dedicated the Circle of Remembrance in 1991, we were able to put the names of all the civilians of which 49 lost their lives. The youngest was three months, a baby was killed. A ch there was several children killed uh, from friendly fire that rained down on Honolulu. Uh, this is a horrific picture. Next slide. This is a, a, a picture that has been published a great deal. This was taken at Kaneohe Bay Naval Air Station on the other side of the island of a sailor that lost his life uh, defending his country. And it, it, to me, it's one of the most uh, uh, mournful pictures of a young man who uh, came to Hawaii, uh, lived uh, a life uh, that he had chosen to be in naval aviation 
and lost that life on 7 December 1941. Next slide. After the attack on Pearl Harbor, um, burials took place. My grandfather was a heavy equipment operator at the Red Hill Project. He and many were uh, uh, asked by the Navy, ordered really by the Navy to uh, dig mass graves. This is not one of those graves that he dug. This is at Kaneohe Bay. And this is a burying of Americans killed at the Naval Air Station that day. You can see the Marines giving a salute. You can see the sailors in their whites uh, in the back. You can see some civilians and officers. You can actually see a defensive machine gun position on the hillside. And I have gone to that site. I have finally found it. The reason it's difficult to find, um, this area, by the way, was where the Hawaiians built, uh, would bury their dead in these dunes. It was part of their tradition. And it's, uh, the irony is not lost that here these Americans lost their lives. Today, where you see the trucks in the background and you see the ocean and, uh, and, um, and the mountain in the back, um, this is on the, on that uh, what the north side of the island, and uh, today this is all part of a golf course. And before you get too alarmed, these these bodies were removed later, and they were placed at uh, the cemetery of the Pacific at the Punch Bowl, so they're no longer there. But that present area now makes up a part of a golf course that uh, serves the military out there today. Thank you. Next slide. This uh, is an interesting picture and it's very dramatic and it's colorful. And the reason it's dramatic, remember that burial? Well, they put the markers there and these flags there, but this was part of John Ford's film that he made uh, later uh, uh, called December 7th. And so they reenacted uh, this burial scene with these sailors. And so you can see the red lays and you can see the American flags. And this is where that picture comes from. It's a recreation of the burial service and, and a marking where these men are buried. And you can see you know, from the other picture, the hillside there, but it was actually part of the film, December 7th, that John Ford made. Very controversial film, but we'll, maybe we'll talk about that in another time. Next slide. This is the USS Arizona. The picture to your right um, is the Arizona burning midday. She burned for nearly three days, two and a half days she burned. Today, she still leaks oil. She's been leaking oil since the 7 December 1941. And when you get an opportunity to visit the, after these difficult days pass, uh, you can come to the memorial, look down and you'll still see droplets of oil a droplet comes up every 20 to 30 seconds and then expands out. And that oil and that smell and that sight has been going on since 7 December 1941. The picture to your left with the fires now out, you can see the massive destruction of the Arizona. The Arizona was hit by an aerial bomb at about, uh, oh, about 8.05 or 8.06 just about 10 or 11 minutes after the attack began, it landed in the Ford magazines of the Arizona and it literally blew the ship apart. She lifted out of the water, perhaps her bow about 50 feet and the tangled wreckage that you see between, uh, you know, off to the left, going back to where you can see the gun turret is where the explosion occurred and when we, I used to dive on the ship, and when you dive in that area, it's as if a monster had clawed out a, a section of the vessel. The destruction there is that three decks are not there, and there's a chasm in there. And so she sank, and uh, on the harbor bottom, remember it being shallow, and so she found her very quickly. And today, uh, what, they, what we have is the bottom hull of the ship. All of the superstructure you see sticking out of the water there, um, that is, was removed uh, during the war and then removed again in uh, 1960 when they made way for the memorial. 
But if you look carefully, you can see the mooring case, one of them blackened by the fire and explosion. But the mooring case on those sides or keys are the ones that are still there and you can see them. And those are the ones we're preserving. But the explosion of the Arizona, my grandfather saw it and I asked him about it. And he said, uh, he didn't know what ship it was at the time, but he said it wasn't a loud explosion, but a terrific concussion that he could feel and he was nearly a half mile away. And so it just was massive, over a million pounds of explosives, nearly a kiloton of energy was released when the Arizona exploded. It killed 1,177 officers, sailors, and Marines. And their names, I'll show you in a few moments, are remembered at the Pearl Harbor Memorial. Next slide. Um, the Japanese uh, created these postcards during the war of their successful campaigns. I've collected them over the years. Uh, this is the one over Pearl Harbor, highly detailed. The only thing incorrect about it is the Japanese Hinamaru, which is the red circle. It was completely red at the time. It didn't have a white outline. And so that's just a detail that bugs, uh, you know, bean counters like myself. But the impression of this is they commemorated this victorious attack, which was highly successful. And if you look carefully down towards the bottom, or rather the middle towards Fort Island, you'll see dark black smoke and an orange flame. That is, that is illustrating the Arizona exploding. So that's how they would uh, remember that. And uh, of course, there were the photos of the attack were put in their papers and things like that. But that was the series of postcards that, that uh, they produced during the war. Next slide. In contrast to that, this is how we remember Pearl Harbor. After the war was underway, uh, the Bureau of Information and other groups uh, put together posters. These, when I say other groups, other governmental groups. And this is how they would have these posters in places where you worked, especially in factories, to inspire you that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain. And this flag you see that's tattered and torn, uh, it was that at Pearl Harbor. Actually, the artist was inspired by the filming John Ford did at Midway of, in June of 1942 and took that impression of that tattered flag that is in color film and applied it to the Pearl Harbor uh, backdrop with the black smoke. It's one of my favorite of the, of the uh, December 7th posters. There's many of them were made, but this one emotionally, for me anyway, touches me because of the, the damage and the death that was brought here represented uh, in, in this flag as being tattered and the resolve uh, in it, which is Lincoln's words, and, uh, and, and inspiring people to um, in the war effort that would last nearly four years. And the other thing that 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 I think that's important, and I didn't have a chance to touch on it, the Japanese had reached a point, you know, in November of 1942 that they that negotiations with the United States was not going to work. And, um, and they had already been pre-planning the attack on Pearl Harbor in January of 19, uh, for, uh, 40, uh, 1940. And so as a result, when, when they, 1941, excuse me, as a result of that, they, they moved forward with a planning of the attack. They, they had hoped negotiations with the United States would be successful. Um, uh, they had reached an impasse. For the Americans uh, and our government under Ro Franklin Roosevelt, we were also extremely upset that the Japanese had signed the tripartite pact. They had allied themselves with the Nazis of Germany and Hitler and the fascists of Italy under Mussolini. They had clearly now reached a, a, an agreement that made them now the ax, part of the Axis powers and negotiating with a country that had now made an alliance with them was, was extremely difficult. And uh, it led to a, a failure in negotiations. And in fact, when the attack was taking place, Japanese diplomats were in the Secretary of State Hall's office. They were unaware that there was an attack underway. And the Secretary of State at the time, Cordell Hall, uh, uttered some pretty 
harsh words towards him in that office. Um, Nomura and Caruso, who were the diplomats, uh, left that place shaken and broken. Next slide. This is um, um, my home uh, and the home for all the park rangers and staff and superintendent that uh, work. This is the Pearl Harbor Visitor Center. We are now known as the Pearl Harbor National Memorial. I've been there long enough to go through four name changes. Um, this is the external lawn where there's a number of exhibits. The theater you'll see is the large building near the shoreline. Um, and the pier you see is the boats that normally there be the Navy boats there because we have a partnership with the Navy. The Navy takes the visitors to the memorial with on their boats and the park rangers are on the memorial. You'll see a film that lasts 23 minutes. I help work on that film with Bob Chenoweth, the good friend of mine. In the background is the museum galleries and the offices and the bookstore and the education building. So this was um, finished in 2010 and this sprawling uh, visitor center sees uh, when normally we would see three to 4,000 visitors a day. And unfortunately with COVID, we're seeing less than maybe 50 to 60 people uh, per hour, um, sometimes just a couple hundred a day, but um, hopefully uh, things will be better in the future. But this is the visitor center, the Pearl Harbor, uh, uh, National Memorial Visitor Center, and this is what would await you when you come to visit us. Next slide. This is an illustration uh, done by Tom Freeman of the uh, 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 showing the memorial and the placement of the piers that's suspended above the ship. It doesn't touch it. The Navy uh, wanted to make sure that there was nothing built on the on the ship itself. Of course, the ship. It, over a period of years will deteriorate, but it, she's in fairly good shape even today. So they suspended it with these piers on either side. This memorial was uh, dedicated in on Memorial Day 1962. The architect, Alfred Price, was a refugee from Austria, fleeing the Nazis of Austria. He came to Hawaii. He was an architect and eventually would be a professor at the University of Hawaii. When the war breaks out, all enemy aliens in which he was considered one were picked up and incarcerated and they found out uh, after months of, of interrogation and, and uh, in, you know, isolation for Alfred, he was found to be an okay guy and he went to work for the Navy designing buildings during the war and helping out with the war effort. Alfred Price's design is to me just, um, just so special and evokes that that kind of sentiment and feeling. He said uh, the depression you see in the center of the memorial, because this is like a bridge-like structure, uh, he said uh, uh, kind of leaves a feeling of the, the low point of American morale, but yet the memorial rises up on either side, meaning the high point, the ending of the war and, uh, and the uh, beginning of peace. Uh, he was a firm believer in that. If you see there, you'll see a grill on the left side, and that's uh, the tree of life, a uh, contemporary tree of life, and it's on both sides. And in, in the morning, if you go out there, the silhouette of that tree of life is reflected on the wall of marble that has their names of those killed aboard USS Arizona. Next slide. This is a, a dramatic picture. Um, I, I took some of these pictures, but not this particular one. Um, this is uh, in a helicopter above the Arizona. You can see the bow. And remember I told you it was like a monster clawed out part of the ship. You can see that there's a space, that there's no wreckage. And then you see the top of, of a gun turret number two, and then the rest of the ship going underneath. And you can see how it spans across. And then on the top side, that's the edge of Ford Island. And you can see that this beautiful kind of aqua green uh, of the harbor. And you can see one of the uh, one of the tour boats that we have that take the visitors to the memorial uh, along the pier there. Next slide. Uh, this is the wall uh, of all the men killed aboard USS Arizona. Um, when I first came to the memorial in 1985, uh, it 
we had the December 7th ceremony and it rained so hard, we had to bring the, nearly 200 people into this room uh, and conduct the ceremony. I was, this was my first year as a permanent ranger. I had worked as a seasonal ranger at Little Bighorn for uh, six seasons and I was starting my career here. And if you look to the left uh, where the grill is, I was told to stand at attention on this side with a park ranger on the other side and sitting right in front of me was all of the prominent uh, uh, dignitaries. And one of them was one of my heroes, Senator Daniel Inouye. And, and there he was. And, and I had a chance to meet him and later did an interview with him over the years. He always came as a senator. Uh, we would have both our senators and congressmen always come. The mayor uh, comes it, December 7th in Hawaii is an extremely important day uh, locally for people. It's a time for us to remember those uh, both military and civilians that lost their lives. So this is an alphabetized list of the 1,177 uh, sailors, officers, and Marines that died. And if you look at these little small boxes on the bottom of the picture, those are the men, the names of the men that are interned in the Arizona so uh, internment takes place. What is that? Uh, what, you have to be on the ship, the USS Arizona, uh, on December 7th, and then um, you can request to have your ashes placed in the ship. And so we have placed over 40 uh, urns in, the, in the, uh, the hull of the Arizona. And so their names are listed there. And that is the end of my a presentation and we'll be happy to answer any questions you have or um, um, yeah it's, it's time to play stump the ranger and we have lots of questions that was amazing you're uh, it's an interesting subject but hearing someone so passionate about it is uh, it, it makes it even more delightful thank you Daniel so thank um, you. we have Tons of questions, but um, I'll start with um, this. Um, uh, was radar not invented yet at the time of yes. this attack? In, in a, a program as as, as 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 compact as it had to be, radar was an interesting story. We had radar. We had six mobile radars set up. Only one was operational that morning. Radar operated from basically um, uh, four in the morning to, uh, to about seven o'clock. And so uh, the uh, radar stations were shut down. The one at Opana on the North shore of Oahu was allowed to stay open one more hour for training. They were the ones that picked up a target. They didn't know who it was. They just, it was the largest target they'd ever seen. And radar wasn't like individual blips. Um, Think of radar in those days, you had a screen and the larger the spike, like a seismic wave, electronic seismic wave, the bigger the target. This was the biggest target they'd ever seen. So privates Elliot and Lockhart turned the radar towards Kauai to make sure it was working and check the register off that island. And it came back normal. The, the normal register turned it back and the target was coming. They have, uh, George Elliott would eventually convince um, his other operator uh, to, uh, they needed to call this into the information center. Now keep in mind radar is brand new and the information center is brand new. And a guy that has been sent down there from Wheeler Field, who's one of their top pilots, Kermit Tyler is in charge. He has, this is his first day on the job. So he had a walkthrough on Wednesday, and here he finds himself at the information center. What's important to remember is when he drove in, the radio was on. Now, what's, what, what are you talking about, Dan? Radio only operated to midnight. A friend of him told him, when we have planes coming in from the West Coast, we keep the radio on so they can beam on it. And when he drove in, the radio was on. So when they got the report, he told them not to worry about it. He thought they were friendly planes that they had picked up. Well, indeed, there were friendly planes in the air. That flight of B-17s that I talked about, that's what 
Kermit Tyler thought. He was right. There were planes coming, but the target was the Japanese planes because you fly down to Hawaii. You don't fly across. You fly down. So if you're leaving from San Francisco or Los Angeles, you fly down to Hawaii. If you want to get an idea where we are, just take a, I think it's a latitudinal line, and you'll go west, and you'll go to Mexico City. That's how deep we're down towards the equator. That's interesting, and that leads me to the next question. Did uh, I'm going to squish a couple together. Okay. One, um, did people who were protecting Pearl Harbor think the planes coming in from the north were Americans? And second, was there any warning? No. Uh, here's the thing. They were as surprised as anybody. This was Sunday. So uh, Saturday night, dances, trips to, to Waikiki, to Honolulu. Um, for the most part of the airfields, the guys were resting and sleeping. They were completely taken by surprise. At Pearl Harbor, the ships were already active by 5 a.m. They're going about their regular duties of cleaning the ship, getting ready for liberty. Church services are going to be done. People breakfast at the, at, at, you know. So it was all of that. The ships were pretty much alive. And in fact, the band was assembled on the USS Nevada and began uh, playing the Star Spangled Banner as the attack began. So it was one of uh, utter surprise for the men that were in Pearl Harbor and certainly terrifying surprise as strafing planes and dive bombers hit the airfield. Uh, some other people, and I'm gonna, uh, a bunch of questions, I'm gonna uh, again put them together because they're sort of similar. Um, was any blame placed on any of the American military personnel for allowing this to happen? And did any Americans get in trouble for this? Yes, there was a huge investigation, uh, congressional investigations that went on for years. Um, and those, uh, those are extremely valuable to those of us that are interested in Pearl Harbor. As a professional historian, these are the investigations are, it, it, they, they brought forth the individuals to testify before Congress. And there are, there's like, I think, gosh, I'd be guessing, but at least over 30 tomes of material uh, there. And they're the joint investigation of the Congress. Um, the blame of the attack uh, fell upon Admiral Kimmel and General Short. And General Short, respectively, was in charge of the Army, troops, and the airfields. He was in charge of the defense of the island. Admiral Kimmel was in charge of the Pacific Fleet. There's a flurry of controversy that has surrounded that. I was part of an investigative committee uh, that, was, uh, that came here to look into whether they should get their stars back. And that was during the Clinton administration. And, um, the, um, I'm, and uh, I'm slipping because I'm forgetting my good friend right now. And we co-authored a book about our experiences being on that committee and how we felt about uh, whether they should get their stars or not. There's one thing that people forget, and they're sometimes reminded of this. Um, if it's on your watch, it's your responsibility. And for, uh, uh, unfortunately for Admiral Kimmel, it was on his watch. And Admiral Kimmel was replaced by Chester Nimitz. One could argue who would be better to, to prosecute the war for the Navy Admiral Kimmel or, uh, or, or Chester Nimitz. That's part of a more of a scholarly discussion, but that's what happened. And uh, from then the Navy moved forward. Um, the, the stain of that has affected that family to this day. Mm. Um, I guess uh, moving in a completely different direction, um, there were a couple of, well, first I want to tell you comments from the audience are coming in that your passion is evident. This is fantastic. Everyone is loving this presentation. The pictures and stories are fantastic. Um, how long did the attack take from word go until the end of the sentence? How long, how long was Pearl Harbor attacked for? It was under attack for two hours. The first attack- Two hours. Two hours. So the first wave came in, they departed shortly before nine o'clock, by about 8.40, 
there was a there it, t about till nine o'clock there was a lull. Then the second wave came in about a half hour later, 45 minutes later, and it began again. And so you can imagine you thought it was over, and here they are again. The Japanese left no chance to um, to allow the Pacific Fleet to live. And so you, you, there was 21 ships sunk or damaged in the attack. There were literally, you know, almost over a hundred planes damaged or destroyed. So for a moment, the Pacific fleet was inept, but they would recover. They, there would be a huge salvage operation that defied engineering. They invented the engineering. So the Pacific's fleet was not destroyed, but heavily damaged. And the carriers that were at sea were vital to the, the, you know, the prosecution of the Pacific War. Keep in mind, this is really interesting. Within a year, most of the battleships and cruisers and other ships that have been damaged or sunk in the attack are back. Only the Oklahoma will not come back and the Arizona. Those two battleships are taken out. The USS Utah, it will not see service again, but the rest do. There was over uh, 91 ships in the harbor. The other part of it is those carriers will play key roles in the bat. Think about this. In May of 1942, just less than you know, six months after Pearl Harbor, we engaged the Japanese in a draw at Coral Sea, but we stopped the Japanese from their invasion plans there. June, uh, June 6th, or June 4th, rather, the Battle of Midway, 1942. That's six months, seven months after Pearl Harbor. We are now on the offensive, and that is the beginning of the turning point. Think about this, too. In August of 1942, we are landing troops in the Solomons. We're beginning the march towards Tokyo. Wow. Uh, yeah. So the, the elasticity of the American military to bounce back from the defeat at Pearl Harbor, the most serious defeat in our history, navally speaking, they do bounce back. So the destruction of Pearl Harbor, and you can imagine the public relations issue of a sneak attack, as they called it in those days, um, with it, what we talk about it today as a preemptive strike. Heard anybody using those lately? <laughs> the preemptive strike is what, we, what, what the Japanese surprise attack was. Of course, you can imagine that, that we felt stabbed in the back. These weren't the rules of war, according to us. And so um, it, it was the, the war in the Pacific was the most brutal and hatred-based war in, in that history. Daniel, we have Florida. about a minute here uh, to to wrap this up. So uh, two things I'm gonna say. Um, if anybody is still interested, um, mm -hmm. we're gonna hang on for about 10 more minutes and do a okay. couple, a bit more Q&A with Daniel. He's offered uh, to spend a little more time with us, even though he lives in Hawaii and could be swimming. Um, no. <laughs> thank you so much for joining us this afternoon for our program. Please take a moment to fill out the survey that's in the chat. This helps us to make sure that our programming is on the mark for us and allows us to report back to our generous donors. Please also join us for our upcoming virtual program. Our next program is the Pfeffer Family Forum. That's uh, with Rabbi Ariel Berger, uh, a devoted protege of Professor Ali Wazel. That's this Sunday at 6, December 6th at 3 o'clock p.m. Central Time. Um, we look forward to seeing you there. There were uh, several more questions that we didn't get Matthew, to. Uh, yes. Can I just do this? Uh, this is a book that I recommend for reading, Day of Infamy by Walter Lord. This is for the first time reader. It's a wonderful book. It's told through the voices of those that were there, both American and Japanese. And the best book ever written on Pearl Harbor and the most thorough is At Dawn We Slept by Gordon Frank. This is the best book you can read, the most authentic, and deals with also the history and controversy surrounding Pearl Harbor. Excellent, thank you. Um, two, um, I wanna ask, does your, uh, does your particular park have a website that yes, people can we visit? Yes, have a website, can... and I'll make sure you get it. We have a, a bookstore, and uh, the bookstore is a private nonprofit. All the national parks have it, 
and uh, it, it, and uh, Pearl Harbor Historic Parks. If it, it's Pacific Historic Parks is what it's called. But I'll make sure that we get that. And and if people decide to purchase, we have a, a huge collection of Pearl Harbor uh, books and memorabilia there. And uh, so it, they can they can become members as as well, like your association as well. And this is this is really important. So we invite them to do that. And I'll make sure you guys get the link for that. Um, and now I just kind of want to go through some of these questions uh, that have come sure. in. Um, uh, one is kind of a fun question. If you are a certified diver, can you go in by yourself? No, um, the diving on the Arizona is, um, is regulated to the National Park Service dive operations and cultural resources. Um, we have provided uh, a number of videos that are available on our website and, uh, and, and we have uh, incredible images that were taken. National Geographic and Discovery Channel did some programs where we actually went inside and photographed inside the ship. That's where we actually were stunned to find uniforms still hanging in the closets. Oh. And, and we couldn't believe that it, they were still there. We also found the Admiral's table and a phone still hooked to, to its uh, attachment. Um, there are a number of, of, of programs of done on the underwater. And then um, uh, the National Park Service has been the ones to conduct the dives. I, when I was lucky enough to be part of the National Geographic dive team, and I was just there to assist like that with wires. And all of a sudden this guy hands me this like big toaster and it's the camera. And I, he, he points for me to take it and I take it. And I never thought I was going to do this. And I went down towards the stern on the, uh, on the uh, starboard side. And they said they, th there was divers there. And I inserted it. And they had already pre-lit the Admiral's uh, you know, uh, compartment. And in it went. And the motors, and all of a sudden, it came to a life. And the motors took it away from my hands. And in it went. That is a moment I'll never forget. Wow. Yeah. We. Uh... I can't, so, yes. Even at the at the museum, we have a blanket in our collection that wrapped a woman named Sephora Katz when she was a child, uh, and she uh, wrapped it around herself. And when we were first opening the museum, we were cleaning the cases, and the static from the cloth made the tassels on the blanket move. And it was oh, one of the sorts of moments where you you know yeah. history is so alive. Um, well, there's a spirit to these things. That's the thing. There's there is there's just this emotional attachment and, and, and yeah, that, that, that touches me. You just telling me that. Several people have uh, made mention of um, the aircraft carriers, not all being right there at that yeah. moment. Um, yeah. Was this the beginning of the age of the aircraft carrier and, and sort of abandoning battleships? The age of the aircraft carrier was present, but it hadn't been tested. Pearl Harbor was, you know, the event that reshaped, you know, uh, naval history and naval tactics. It became apparent to Nimitz that the traditional battles of World War I, naval, navally speaking, were over. They will happen, but it's the aircraft carrier that is the most potent weapon. It's interesting that we started with a handful of carriers at the beginning of the war, we have over a hundred at the end of the war. So even today, the aircraft carrier has its place. As, as, and, and then during World War II and in the Pacific, in particular Pacific, because other carriers will be used in the, the uh, war with Germany and Italy, but those carriers, a lot of them will be used to attack the U-boats and not necessarily in big naval engagements. There'll be used for that, these little small, what they call Jeep carriers. But when you think of the growth of the Pacific fleet and the use of aircraft carriers as we battle our way across, they're an, they're an extremely important element in the prosecution of the Pacific War. Invaluable. Um, much like your storytelling today, um, I'm seeing comments across the board. I, I'm going to need to share these with you, but people are saying that they've been to many Pearl Harbor programs, but have never heard such detailed information before. And some of the images were very new to them. Um, oh, great. Thank you for making this program so amazing, Daniel. Um, yeah, thank you. 
I guess we'll we'll uh, we'll wrap it up with kind of a weighty one. Um, so uh, mentioning the fact that um, Kimmel and Short uh, took a lot of the blame. Uh, right. Would it have been more appropriate to put the blame somewhere else? Or were they well, just bigger heads? I would think that it, the, the idea of blame uh, goes all the way up to the White House. Fair. So, um, it, it, because all of them had a role in its responsibility. The thing is, the Japanese were determined to do this. They had made a decision to go to war with the United States. They had made a decision of how they would prosecute that war with a surprise attack at Pearl Harbor, giving them a resolute advantage. Um, there were footsteps and of, of, of uh, interpretation of what the Japanese may be doing. There was a war warning that was sent to the Pacific Fleet, very important, on the 26th of December, that to be on alert accordingly. Were they on alert that morning? No, they weren't. Was it part of what came down on Kimmel and Short? Sure, it was. And, um, and the, the, the most extensive explanation of those responsibilities and the political hailstorm that comes down it is in Gordon Prang's book um, that he wrote, Day of Infamy. And he wrote a supplementary book, but there's a wonderful essay called Revisionism Revisited. Mm -hmm. And it talks about the politics of memory. As you know, there's a politics of memory about the Holocaust. There's Correct. the deniers and all of that. But the politics of memory for Pearl Harbor, that essay is given, I give that essay to every park ranger for him to read it because he is going or she is going to get those questions. And that allows people, I, in fact, I have shared it with people that were determined that, you know, they should have, they should, those guys should have been, you know, put in jail or what's these crazy things, but they, people feel passionate about, it. or the, that President Roosevelt let it happen, that it was a conspiracy, which is ridiculous. But that essay- On the flip side, do you have, do you have Japanese visitors to the site now? Oh, we have tons of Japanese visitors because one of the things we had Japanese visitors come, we had the aviators first come in 1983, three years after the Park Service took over the visitor center. These about 20 aviators came and they didn't come announce that they kind of slipped in and they, because they thought they wouldn't be welcomed. And we, a park ranger who said, those guys are military, called the superintendent. His name was Gary Cummins and Gary Cummins rushed down and met them and shook their hands and wow it was great it yeah, was we, great um, now one of the the interesting parallels we have interns every year that come to the museum from mm -hmm. austria and germany mostly germany right. and in the right. beginning holocaust survivors were very very nervous uh, yes. so to speak about actually dealing with uh, generations later but the grandchildren and great grandchildren of perhaps some of the soldiers that had had taken their families yes. um, and it, it's been a great healing process. And I'm, I'm wondering yes. if you've experienced something similar there by yes. having Japanese visitors. Uh, we, with yeah, we did. I, and what came out of this was the Japanese felt comfortable coming to the memorial. We, be, we had contact with them. There was a guy that, that was instrumental in this. His name's John DiVirgilio. He's a school teacher here, local guy. He uh, came to me and we became friends and still are to this day. And we start to encourage the Japanese meeting the Pearl Harbor survivors. We actually accomplished that. We actually had a symposium and the veterans would be there and they would shake hands. And today, when you go to the Punchbowl National Cemetery on the walkway to the Overlook, there is a, a stone there that has the handshake and the date of Japanese and American reconciliation. And uh, we'll wrap it up with a question from Marlene, who asks, uh, is the USS Arizona open right now to the public? Yes, it is. We are open and um, we're getting a, a couple hundred visitors a day. Um, the tickets are free. They always have been, but now they download them because of COVID on their, com on their cell phone or computer. They just have to show up with that. And the, uh, they can spend the day uh, at seeing the museum 
watching uh, the film and going to the memorial. In fact, this, the visits to the memorial are longer than, than we had before because we were on a very tight time schedule with you know three to 4,000 people on tour. Yeah, so um, <laughs> yeah, so it's a good time to visit and to, yes, it's open and, and we're only closed on Christmas um, and Thanksgiving and New Year's. And uh, I will uh, get the titles of the two books you recommended with their authors. We'll include that in the blast that we send out to all of our visitors. I will tell you that we still have uh, more than half of the room stayed for us. So thank okay. you guys. I really appreciate that. And I'm going to wrap it up with a huge thank you to you, Daniel. Thank okay. you for visiting us from Hawaii. This is uh, our first program with, uh, with the 50th state. So this is great. Well, I hope it's not our last. We we can do other stories here. So um, uh, certainly I can take you on, uh, you know, wartime Hawaii. What was it like? And uh, and show you uh, buildings that still exist and museums that still exist. And there's this whole idea of what was it like during the war in Hawaii. And that's another story. There's a great book that's uh, called Hawaii's War Years by Gwynford Allen. She was a professor at the University of Hawaii and wrote this book as it happened. Fantastic. Well, I'm going to thank you. I'm going to thank our audience on behalf of the museum and our board, staff, volunteers, our CEO, Susan Abrams. And Daniel, you knocked the ball out of the park. Thank you so much for your, for your conversation and time with us today. Well, on behalf of our superintendent, Scott Birch, and all the park rangers from Pearl Harbor National Memorial, aloha. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye.